I'm so happy to be here today with Michael, and uh, we've decided to have a conversation that could be a two-edged sword, <laughs> but we're going to talk about the whole issue of what does it mean to say follow the science? What does it mean to say trust science? And um, I hope it's going to be edifying for us and for anybody who's listening. So, Michael, why did you want to pursue this topic? Um, just a confluence of a lot of different things. Um, I guess for one of the big ones is, is all this stuff with COVID. Um, cause that's obviously like this very large scale. It's like the most, you know, influential event that's, you know, occurred in recent memory, but it's, it, you know, and it's making its way into every facet of life. And then, you know, um, so it's, it's become this sort of large scale experiment in terms of, uh, how does that, you know, this belief in science, how does it actually play itself out in a practical way in a sort of in a real way in people's lives? Um, you know, not just theoretically, but um, what, what are the actual um, consequences that that you are associated with espousing this? Well, I mean, if we step back just a second and say even to say believe in science, it makes it sound more like a religion than like a, a domain of knowledge. Right. And um, that seems to be what has been happening in the last probably couple of centuries, but certainly it's been moving faster and faster recently. This idea that science has all the answers, but I don't think that earlier scientists would have ever had that approach because they tended to think of science as a process by which you can come closer to the truth but you can never actually get there. And that's what keeps you working at it. Otherwise, um, if you could find the truth, then all scientific endeavor would be finished, complete. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's right. Yeah, I don't think they would have ever had this sort of romanticized perspective of like, quote unquote, science as a thing, you know, like where you, you have it today, where, you know, people have little placards they put outside their, their homes and say, we believe in science. And then like a list of other things. And it, it and it's always a weird list of things that are all combined together, which is, I find very strange because they like have z very little to do with one another, but um, it's, it's, it's weird the way it's, it's romanticized, but also like, it's, it's kind of a non, like if you, if you, you know, showed that to Isaac Newton, it would, it would kind of be like, well, what is, that's kind of a nonsense sort of thing. Right. Cause like you said, it's, it's not a, it's not any one thing. It's a sort of process that um, is forever, if anything, eroding um, our confidence in in what were previously thought of uh, truth. So it's, um, um, in, in some sense, it, to um, a real belief in science would be a sort of um, hyper criticism and skepticism towards everything, which is not not at all what I see attached to this new. You know, we believe in science. Uh, you know, what do you call it? Prince, spirit, or principality? That is, you know, that goes around and people, you know, you know, tout it. It seems to be more attached to an idea of some sort of expertise than to some to than to science. Yeah, you know, I mean, in the old days, they used to say an expert is someone who's fifty miles away from home carrying a briefcase because. Of course, you're never a prophet in your own hometown, but as mm. soon as you get away and you've got a briefcase full of data, you can say anything to anybody. Um, yeah. So it also gets into this whole issue of what is data and how can it be used? And beyond that, it falls over into the whole thing of combinatorial explosion. So to even say science, you're already taking into account everything in the known universe. So to say, <laughs> to say I believe science is to say, I believe that everything that science has discovered up to this point about the known universe is absolutely true and you know carved in stone. It's a it's a very weird thing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really strange. And what's funny too is like I feel like even having this conversation kind of lumps you into a camp of people that well, I, you probably don't believe in science or like they like. Um, you probably don't believe in evolution or like there's a million things that people would assume. Um, and I, you know, by temperament and nature, I am very skeptical and um, 
and sort of um, even cynical, even at times about, you know, our ability to know things. So I, I, I do appreciate um, the efforts of real scientists to kind of, to always, um, you know, kind of distrust something and try and prove something some, through some iterative process. You know, I've also worked in um, technology for a long time as a practitioner and, and the specific roles I've often played in technology is where I'm not, I don't often have access to the underlying mechanisms of how something works, but I'm, I'm still in a practitioner mode of having to make it work. So I'm often in that kind of like experimental mode of like, I have this black box, I got to get it to work. And I don't, and the only way you can do that is to think really kind of slowly and methodically do lots of experiments. If I do this, like it works. If I, if I turn this feature off, it breaks, you know, like, and go through all the iterations to try and, you know, like break something so that I can understand how it works. Um, and, you know, you were talking about experts earlier. And I think one of the best um, definitions I've heard of an expert that actually holds water for me and I've kind of retained it is an expert is somebody that knows a thousand ways not to do something. And, and what that, what that speaks to me of is about real world, like tactile hands-on keyboard or whatever the, whatever the mode of inquiry is like sense, like I'm actually seeing it with my own eyes experience of like, I tried that. It failed. I tried that. It failed. Um, and now I, from all that failure, I have some limited knowledge about here's some ways you can wave, you know, weave your way through this labyrinth and actually get some, you know, effective results. Well, that makes me think a little bit about, um, I told you I'd been listening to this Ian McGilchrist video today where he's talking about the left and right hemispheres and how that affects science. And so I thought maybe I could show a clip I have two clips actually. The first one is is a little bit, it's very short, a little bit more general. The second one is a little bit more specific and maybe we can do that later. Um, okay, so it won't let me optimize for video clip, but oh well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. I hope the sound is adequate. Our painting of the left hemisphere as being um, the sort of the cartoon scientist. Yes, I very, very much dislike and... Wait, can you hear that? Yeah, I can hear fine. Okay, okay. Normally reject the idea of the brain as a computer. But in one, because I don't believe it is at all like a computer, but... <laughs> In one sense, the left hemisphere is rather like your personal computer in that it can do certain procedures very well and much faster than you can. But you're the one that gathers the data and poses the problem. You give it to the left hemisphere and it goes, oh, good, more of that. We do it, spew out the data, but it doesn't actually understand what the data mean. You, like taking your data from the computer, interpret it again in the real world out of which your question arose. So in that sense, the left hemisphere is kind of has a kind of mechanical smartness, but it doesn't have true insight, imagination, understanding, all the things that are so important in a human and can't really be put into an algorithm. Okay. So um, I like the way that he put that about um, the 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 scientist has to is, is also is not only the one who's looking at the data, but he's the one who's choosing which data to look at. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very significant in what's happening right now because we are awash in data. Yeah. I and mean, there's data coming from every direction. So whatever data you want, you can go out there and find. So of course, and later on when he's talking about the left hemisphere, he says the left, left hemisphere has a tendency to only want to believe what it wants to believe based on the theory that it already has. And so it's going to automatically look for data that supports the point of view that it has already. Yeah, and so I, and I think part of what that is, is so we were talking about this earlier, You're, you were linking narrative with narrow. 
which and, and we were before we, we got on here we were you were we were speculating whether, whether there was some you know origin between those two words having that 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 shared um beginning but there, there's something about that like we, we always have to compress the world down to do anything effectively you you can't you can't do anything well while you're like you know doing five other things you have to narrow in and focus and and um apply that that awareness that those the limited kind of bandwidth and processing power to a, a narrow scope of things so that you can you can do it adequately um and I think Peterson said this, we always, you know, and, and what we're doing when, when we, when we create a narrative, it's the same thing as creating a map. We're creating a, a map of that space so that we know, okay, here are the areas to pay attention to. And here's the areas that can be safely ignored. And you want that, you want that map to be, he always points out that you want that map to be your, your first draft of it's going to be really poor and you have to, ne you almost necessarily have to do that because you, we're doing this all the time, second by second. We're always, you know, taking these maps and rewriting them. And it's, it, it's a very intensive process to, it's, it's costly to, to rewrite your map. So you want to, you want it to be as good as it needs to be to effectively get the results you want, but no better because you don't, you know, to optimize it further, um, is is too costly because of just the number of things you have to do as a biological being to survive in the world. So you always got to, you're always, there's always going to be this bias towards the worst version of something that works being the dominant version in everybody's mind. If that makes sense. Well, it, it, and it maps right over onto what McGilchrist was saying too, when in another clip, he's talking about how the left hemisphere has a tendency to mistake the map for the territory it wants to say that the map is the territory so it flattens everything down just to the map and loses all the complexity and the mystery of the territory yeah and and what's funny too is you know in peterson when he talks about all this right he he links all this towards um our need as creatures also to balance like our sort of anxiety levels, right? Because hmm. you always, at any given point, you want to have a little bit of chaos because that, that little bit of chaos gives you sort of, um, it brings the right brain into motion. Like it brings your attention. So you're paying attention. Um, it's something things become interesting when the anomalies are there um, so that you're able to, to start to rewrite the map, but to do it in a, but not in the sense of feeling like, oh, well, I need to throw this map in the garbage or even worse, I need to prepare myself for some sort of conflict where I'm going to run for my life or I'm going to fight for my life right now, which is effectively what anxiety does, you know, when, when those anomalies come. And so, um, yeah, there, there's something I think right now where because we are in, as you were pointing out, awash in all this information, in some sense, it's um, it's really giving us many, many more opportunities to poke holes in these maps and show their um, deficiencies. And I think maybe as a sort of bulwark against um, increased anxiety, we're we're becoming more um, what's the word? We're we're becoming more resistant to that that new data we're, we're trying to, we're building thicker walls, I guess, maybe to, to keep out that, those, that anomalous data sets, because there's a sense in which, okay, if we allow that to really get into the system, it's just going to destroy the system. I almost lost your, uh, your thought there, because when you started talking about poking holes in it, all of a sudden this, this memory came back to me of, um, a lecture on biblical principles that I had heard, I don't know, 30 years ago, where he was talking about the father as being the protector of the family. And he said, picture the father as an umbrella over the family. And the family is, is under the umbrella, protected from the elements, protected from the rain, protected from the storm. 
But if the father has gotten himself involved in some sort of sin, if he's allowed himself to go down the road of bitterness or anger or uh, sexual temptation, or if he's gotten involved in any sort of sin, there's all kinds of holes in the umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so the protective aspect of his built-in authority and responsibility is gone because there's so many holes in the umbrella. And when you were talking about that, how we want to poke holes in the map, it made me think that those maps actually have a protective purpose because they protect us from the overwhelming complexity of what the world is made of. That no. we, we wouldn't be able to move forward at all if we didn't have those maps. But at the same time, if people misuse the map and they use it in some sort of authoritarian way against you or they use it to um, insist that you behave in a certain way or if the people who are um, attempting to alter the map, if they have bad intent, they poke all those holes in the map and it no longer has that protective aspect anymore. We're just being flooded with, with all this stuff. Yeah. I don't know well, if that in, makes any sense. It's probably a very bad analogy, but it, it just, no, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> And, and one way to think about the, the postmodern critique is to think of it as it, it's making that point of the map isn't the territory. It's, it's trying to make that point. Um, but in, but it, it wants, it does so in such a way as, as to deny the fact that the map is actually necessary, as you were just pointing out, you like you, you it's, it's, it's a, it's a contingent, you know, and, well, it's, maybe maybe even a necessary part of us being limited creatures that we have to have these limited resolution you know maps of the world and um for instance like when we talk about things like like racism for instance like um i, I think post modernity in in this woke culture is absolutely right to point to um this sort of the fact that the, these biases are so built into us that even if we don't have um, a conscious intention of doing harm, that we can still be ensconced in systems and modes of thought and just, um, you know, biases that, that still have real consequences that are negative. And I think that's absolutely true. But it's, it's um, but it goes, I think where, where it goes wrong is that it, it thinks that, that we can get rid of that completely that we can get rid of biases completely because in some sense, bias is the method whereby we're able to focus on one thing versus not another, you know, and, and biases, certain biases, like, um, you know, you know, having a bias towards your own family or people that, you know, um, is going to, um, is going to impact you. Like, you know, one of the best predictors in terms of how you feel about, um, any given group, whatever it is, like, just name it name is like whether you actually know and interact with and have a friend within that group that you can now there's something in becoming friends with somebody that you all the um you know all the the kind of uh over generalizations just to go away right and you you begin to see someone's basic humanity and the ways that they're like you even though they have experiences that are different than yours um you're able to see how much more like you are than different right when you have somebody that that you're friends with so um, but yeah, I don't know if that, that made any sense. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it, it also made me think that even within your own group, whatever your group is, I mean, if we are groups, I, th I think I, I sort of reject that idea, you know, because I don't think that's a good road to go down, but if we were going to play that game, then I could say within my own group, even within say members of my own family. I can see the places where we are absolutely not at all alike. There's like no connection whatsoever. So to, to imagine that just because you're in a group make, means that you're all the same is within the members of your own group, you can see that clearly. Yeah. But you just can't see it as well when you're looking at another group or when another group is looking at you because 
they automatically assume that because it's a group, I, and I think I was talking earlier about this whole inside outside paradigm. I think that people want to put people in a group because it makes them more manageable because they're mm -hmm. now inside a boundary and that boundary. Yeah, it's, it's a new map generating yeah. mechanism. Yeah. And so it makes it easier to handle. And that's why political ideologies get bundled into one set of criteria. And it's why, but the scary thing is right now, this is happening with science. Science now has a bundle of things that it supposedly is settled. When they say the science is settled about this and this and this and this, the science is settled about evolution, the science is settled about climate change, the science is settled about uh, COVID. If the science is settled, then that means there's no more experimentation, there are no more theories, there are no more new ideas. Are those dead ends now? I mean, is that what they're saying when they say the science is settled? I don't think they're really trying to say that because that would be the end of their scientific careers, right? Yeah, it's, we're in a really strange time where um, in, in a lot of ways, we've, we've picked a lot of the low hanging fruit of, of this scientific method. And so we're getting into finer and finer shades of detail in larger and more complex systems that we're trying to understand with, with this method. And it does make me wonder to what degree, like how effective this reductive method can be. Uh, in understanding something, say, as large as, as the climate um, or, you know, something as large as, you know, the, this, the social effects of, um, you know, the, you know, at a population level effects within across the entire United States, which is not, the United States is not a homogenous place at all, uh, you know, ethnically, you know, culturally, et cetera. Like it's, it's, and so it becomes, um, this assumption that you can you can use this reductive method indefinitely to get more and more uh, insight into reality. I think it, we might have we might have run out of you know road to go. We might be like up against some big mountain that we need to go around. And um, this is kind of where you know my reading of Barfield really comes into play because he his view of final participation is a, a, is a rejoining of this you know, this sort of left-brained approach of where we are so focused on our, um, um, you know, what we can see and what we can, we can reduce and join it to this larger kind of imagination. Um, I think it seems obvious to me that's going to be a necessary component of any forward progress at this point, because um, it seems like science itself as we're, you know, we're talking about here is breaking down because of its need to try and force things into some sort of quote unquote orthodoxy that, you know, so like when we say science now, it, it's not just, well, it's not any scientist. It has to be the right scientists that come from the right institutions that, you know, um, are in good standing at this moment in time with those institutions. Like, so if what it effectively means is that, you know, um, you can't, anybody that has a controversial opinion or, or has made any actual novel discovery, they can't be part of the conversation because they're no, as soon as they have that insight, they've now, by necessity, as soon as they start trying to publish or um, make manifest that insight, they're now outside the, 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 the quote unquote right circle immediately. Um, and um, that's, that's the inherent weakness of the scientific method is the scientific method assumes that you build and build and build upon what's come previously. But all of the great scientific discoveries have been leaps forward, not building, building, building on what's come previously. So, so the scientific method is great for learning certain things, but for making big advancements, you've got to yep. have, you've got to have that creative element. Um, yeah, the things that Ian McGilchrist said in this thing this morning, I thought was so he just, it was just so well put because you and I have talked a lot before about metaphor <clears throat> and the importance of metaphor and that metaphor is just, I mean, that, that it's what the world consists of, basically, <laughs> um, that he, he says metaphor is the gateway to what we see. Mm -hmm. And and so this whole issue of seeing seeing and knowing are intimately interrelated which i realized even more after reading 
I read this, uh, I was reading in John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58 the other day. And uh, Jesus is talking, I can't remember if he's talking to the Pharisees or just talking to the crowd, but he's saying to them, you don't know God. I do know him. And he says a few other things, but that's the basic gist of it. And I was reading that and I thought, huh, I wonder if that no is the same in both instances. When he says to them, you don't know God, I do know him. Is it the same no? I don't know why I thought about that, but I went back and I looked at the Greek and they're not the same. No. So when he says to them, you don't know God, it's the nosco, the gnosis God, the, you know, the knowing, the experiential knowing, like Gnosticism. Or, Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> or agnostic, um, you know, that that root word but when he says i do know him it's aido which is the the word that means perceptual seeing the kind of seeing that's not just seeing and gathering out of the that which is around you what's important but the seeing that's like ah i see yeah i see yeah and that see and that know are intimately interrelated and and that kind of knowing has to be relational. You have to have a relationship. You know, we've used this example before of like uh, a rose bush. You were using the, the, the example of your black box that you deal with yeah. work. You build a relationship with that black box. You begin to know what it wants and what it doesn't want and what works and what doesn't work and what widgets you can turn and what ones you can't turn and how much. And funny enough, you always learn the most when it doesn't work. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's when we learn, <laughs> we learn everything through failure. So. Um, but I, I would also make a quick connection between what you were just saying, uh, this connection between knowing and seeing um, for Barfield, what you're referring to there is the imagination. And so in, in, in we, we tend to think of the imagination in common parlance as sort of like a, you know, well, I just, you know, pop into my mind this idea of like a pink elephant or something else that is just kind of fantastical, but that's not what he meant. What he, what he, what he's talking about um, is a sort of a bringing of things together, um, sort of imaging. Like for instance, like when I see, like from a sense perception perspective right now, all I, all that's coming into my eyes are, you know, this, this two dimensional light that's hitting a, you know, a lens that's focusing in on my retina. And then, you know, but from, from a, just a central perspective, I, I should only see the world in 2d, but like lots of stuff is going on uh, in my mental machinery that brings not even just, not even just my visual perceptions but also the meaning of all the things i'm seeing so that like i'm focusing on your face and not on the paintings behind you while i'm talking to you like all these the, that the meaning of what i'm seeing it's all coming together in a in a in a different way and it's also being integrated with what i'm hearing and you know what i'm thinking about what's been said previously in this conversation where i imagine the conversation is going all that is coming together in my imagination in some sense so it's it's um, it's, it's a, it's a bringing together is what he's describing and what, and what he's saying is that we're doing this all the time and, and really what this would be best counter, um, you know, contrasted to would be that left brain scenario where instead of bringing everything together, I'm, I'm laser focused. I have the spotlight on this one thing and I'm trying to figure out, you know, whether this math equation works out or whether it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I, I want to read a quote, if I can get to it here. Um, I never know when I bring up something like this, does that mess up the screen or do you still see me and it just looks normal? I don't, you, I don't see you sharing yet. No, I'm not sharing. I could share this, I guess. I could share it. Um, I was just going to, I was just going to read it, but um, I can share it. As soon as I start sharing, my screen gets all covered up with a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so here, this uh, quote about seeing, this is a quote that Matt Allison, this is Matt Allison talking about Aristotle. 
He says, Aristotle, somewhere in the metaphysics, I think in the beginning, prized the eyes above and beyond the nose and the lower senses. It was because of its ability or capacity to see opposites, not for what they are and not for what they are not, but to see and to see in such a way that the seeing gathers. That is to say, the seeing does something other than seeing in seeing itself. It gathers the content, so we prize it above our hands. It gathers the content, so we give it more credit than our feet. Perception gathers the material, so we declare our maxims in the language of optics or its contrast, the mysterious beginning of sight. And so I started thinking about that and, and I wrote back to, to Matt that I had just read this, I had been reading that morning this part about Jesus in, uh, in John chapter eight in 56 and 58. And so I connected that up and I wondered if when Aristotle's talking about seeing that way, if it's the same kind of seeing that, that Jesus was talking about when he used that word Edo. So I'd love to go back and look at what, um, Aristotle was Greek, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which word Aristotle was using when he was talking about seeing like that. I'm guessing it might've been the same word that Jesus was using. And, and if I look here a little bit further down, it, you go into the, uh, the Greek um, dictionary and it says that Aido is to see with physical eyes or the seeing that becomes knowing is a gateway to grasp spiritual truth from a physical plane. The constant bridge to mental and spiritual seeing, which is comprehension which I went on to say, it's akin to looking with the eyes of love. It's that kind of seeing because it's got to be relational. And it, it, it's the kind of relational that sees the goodness of being, you know, as Jordan Peterson is always talking about. And this is the piece that I think so many scientists are missing because Ian McGilchrist was talking today about context. And he says, when you take something out of its context and then take it apart and start analyzing it, you've completely destroyed the meaning of it. And he used as an example, taking the heart out of the human body and then looking at it and saying, what is this piece of meat? He says, you'll never understand what a heart is once you've taken it out of its context. It has to be in the context of the body with all of its connections and all of its relationships in order to understand what the heart is and that's true of any of these scientific things i mean when they look at all this data about covid if they're missing the relational issues you know i, I mean so obviously relationship has a great deal to do with the whole spread of covid how are people interacting i mean you know you i don't know whether you ever saw that old series numbers where the mathematician helps the fbi uh, find the bad guys because mm -hmm. he understands how to look at things in terms of patterns and the flow of people and the flow of traffic and, and all of that. And it's all, everything is in relationship with everything else. Yeah. If you miss that and take something out of context and just reduce it down to, you know, the dry desiccated data, you're not going to find out anything useful. Yeah. That, I think that's, that's a great point. It's, it's why it's worrying you know, specifically talking about COVID in the terms of some of the trends that you see where uh, folks at the NIH or the CDC or other, you know, like their um, kind of dictates from having, you know, supposedly read all the papers and, you know, dissected all the data is being used to override what, you know, doctors who are on the front lines every day in, you know, in the ICUs with patients that are dying and, and are finding, you know, treatments that they believe are effective, you know, you can, you can argue the merits about it, but like, certainly my bent is to just somebody that has that, that complex set of data and relationships that you can only get while being in person with somebody, uh, you know, prescribing a variety of treatments and actually watching what unfolds uh, with your own eyes versus, oh, I read in a paper somewhere. Because, I mean, it's very easy for that data to get fabricated, either one way or another, right? You know, to, 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 um, with, with either benign or malicious goals, you know? 
uh, it's very easy to manipulate data. It's very difficult to, you know, have like, you know, reality around itself warp you when you give a patient a drug and you watch what happens over a few course of days and you see it with your own eyes, that's a very different phenomenon. And I feel like it should be given, um, some sort of, um, precedence, you know, just, just, and it seems like the, the exact opposite is happening because of, um, how we're beginning to structure our, you know, reality and society and what we think of quote unquote science. Well, and we want to be careful. And, and you, you had said this even before we started recording, you want to be careful that you're not attributing um, malicious motives to the people who might misinterpret or alter the data or skew the data a little bit this way or that. It doesn't necessarily have to be even a monetary motive. It can just be I believe a certain thing, therefore the data looks a certain way to me. And, and, and that can cause a person to cherry pick data or, or even to just have a different perspective. Or even just the, the weight of responsibility, I think sometimes can, can move people towards indecision sometimes. And when you're looking at just dry facts, you can, you can say, okay, there isn't enough here to say something meaningfully one way or another so i'm going to move on to the next thing and i'm going to ignore this because this is i don't have the the energy or bandwidth to kind of get deeper or do some some further investigation like go go ahead i was just going to say one of the tragedies of our current time is that everything gets wound up in politics now so oh yeah um you know when when this whole covid thing started we had such a we had a moment that could have turned into a wonderful moment for humankind where there was this big pause and there could have been a reset in the way we relate to one another across national boundaries and within our own boundaries and how we could have been, a, it could have been a great change in how we do things, but instead it got all wound up in politics. Every single country's decisions got wound up in their own internal politics countries are fighting with other countries over how to do this. And pretty soon, instead of it being 180 different experiments going on where we could choose which ones work the best, everybody's doing the same thing because they're all following the science. And who came up with that science, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this might be a good place to play that video of um, Pajot and um, Rafe Kelly that we were talking about. Oh, by all means, can you put it up? Yeah, let's see if it'll let me. Oh, of course. It won't work? It's gonna kick me out real quick. Um, okay, let, I, me, let me do it then, okay? Okay. So I'm going to share a screen on this video that you wanted to show everybody. And uh, for some reason, it will not allow me to optimize for video clip on here, but here we go again. And we've got a glitch on my computer, of course. Play, hit play. Yep. Hit play, but I must have uh, must have lost some. Um, See if you just hit refresh, maybe. They uh. See if that comes through. Well, we get get a good chance to look at. <laughs> Joe and Rafe Kelly together. Rafe looks like he's uh, contemplating something amazing. And the title of this video, for anybody who wants to look for it, is Bridging the Mythological and Scientific Worldviews with Jonathan Pajot. If it doesn't come up, I can, I can kind of summarize what they're talking about. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, we... We didn't have any problem with the Miguel Chris clips, so I don't know what's happening here. Yeah, why don't you just summarize it for us, Michael? So essentially, what 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 happens is, you know, um, 
if we take this intuitive <laughs> approach and then some sort of pragmatism and some sort okay, of I'll go uh, back. multi multi-factor. Um, to the, the reality that people have different intuitions or different orientations, symbolic systems that they operate within. And there's not necessarily, I, one, there's conflict there. It's what it feels like, right? Yeah. And and one one reaction to that is sort of I think the Verveki response, which is let's step outside of the narratives and treat them as instrumental rather than existing within them, right? And then we can have the religion that is not a religion, and then we don't have to deal with the fact that 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 um, that that the Islamic description, the Muslim description of of the of, of Christ is is not congruent with the Christian description of Christ, right? Like he he he's respected there, but but the meaning of what he did isn't possible to glean from the the description that they give, and so so there there's inherently a potential for conflict, and I I don't know if that's the same in Buddhism and, and Taoism versus Christianity. I tend to think that they're more potentially congruent, but but whatever there 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 are going to be places where that's not. Where the where the, the the two systems are going to be in conflict, right? And how do we how do we navigate those waters with without a clear epistemology? Sorry, you broke down. How do you said how do we navigate those waters without a clearer epistemology? Yeah. Um, so obviously, okay. So there there are many things to say. One is that. We can only perceive the pure pattern from an embodied place. And, and to pretend that you can, or to pretend that you are leaving that is to delude yourself. This is what I think. And so I think that the position or the universalist position of saying, I'm going to step outside of these narratives in order to be able to see them all is, is a delusion. It's still a narrative. Uh, it's just that you don't, you don't see it. It's the, it's the narrative of the Tower of Babel. It's the narrative of, you know, and it and it doesn't, and what it leads to is it actually will lead to to uh, fragmentation. It'll lead to a breakdown. The desire to kind of it'll lead to not having a common, not having a real common narrative, and so therefore it'll be like a competition. That's where it's going to be even more so a competition of narratives, because you have to embody something. Like yeah. you have to you have to be in the in a path. Like you have so, to be on a, on a road going somewhere. And if you say like, I'm going to stand above all these roads and I'm going to say, well, actually I noticed that all these roads lead to the same place, but you're not, you're not doing it. You're not on the, you're not actually doing it. Um, so that's one thing. Like that's one thing in terms of the, of, of the, of that, of that problem is I think that the idea of saying that someone is going to not engage or kind of rise above uh, is a, uh, it's, it's similar to Brett Weinstein when he says, it's similar to Sam Harris or Brett Weinstein when they, when they say something like, don't you see? Like when, when Brett Weinstein just says, don't you see that this is obviously moral? And you're like, what? You don't I, see yeah. your own story. Like you always are in a story. This, no, to me, it's just yeah. inevitable. Unless you're so like you in the mystical probably end it there. Like once you like. Wow, that is so interesting because it just exactly fits in with what uh, what I was saying earlier about the inside and outside thing that, you know, I spent six episodes with Glenn talking about what life consists of. And, well, he, and if, if you, if I think if he continues there, he actually mentions strong emergence in particular further along through in the next five minutes or so. He, he, he specifically talks about strong emergence and how you can't, that what happens at this layer, you can't predict what's going to happen at this higher layer that it's something completely different. Well, so what, what um, Jonathan said was you can only perceive the pure pattern from an embodied place. You have to enter in in order to get any understanding at all of what's going on inside. And just take, for example, a, a, human, a cell of a human body. From the outside of that cell, you can't tell much at all about what it is. I mean, you can, you can manipulate the cell, you can pick it up and put it on a Petri dish, you can take pictures of the outside of the cell, but you don't really know what's going on inside of it until you get inside of it. And then, 
then it opens up and, and over the last hundred years, what they've discovered inside a cell is that entire worlds open up inside that cell and it, you can't even get down deep enough inside that cell to figure out all what's going on. And so Jonathan went on to say that stepping outside to, or above to try to see all these different things is a delusion and it will automatically lead to fragmentation because you don't have a common vision and that's exactly it. If you've never entered in, let's take as an example, the body of Christ. From the outside, you look at the church and of course you can, you can judge the church in a lot of different ways. You can say, well, the church has done a lot of good. They've built hospitals. They've, they've, um, they've helped people put their families back together. You know, you can, you can have that view or you can have the view of the church is a political organ and it's it's authoritarian and it damages people. But when you enter into the church and you become a part of the body of the church and you see the complexity of all the people that are involved and it's a completely different view. You have the view from the inside or the outside. The outside view is, is a, a method of control or manipulation and it's never going to be as meaningful as the inside view. Yeah. I mean, thinking back to what we were talking about with, you know, looking at, you know, frontline doctors treating COVID patients versus administrators, right? The, the administrator thinks, or the, the guy in AH thinks, I can stand outside all these narratives about all the data coming from all over the world, and I can somehow see the pure pattern. I can distill that out. Um, and that's, and what Jonathan's saying here is that actually you're more prone to being swayed by quote unquote narratives in that, that data only mode than the person that's sitting in front of somebody that has so much more kind of sensory data that's coming in and telling them what to think versus the person that's just looking at a report or an email or um, talking to somebody on the phone about what they, they thought about something. Right. So um and I, I thought it really interesting too that he references the Tower of Babel, which is this place where humanity seems intent on on coming up with a single narrative, right? That we're all going to work in this one narrative uh, towards achieving some goal, and it ends in fragmentation and dissolution that that corrupts the very languages themselves that they're speak, trying to speak to one another. Which is part of what I see with this, because I do see like even the definitions of words become very contentious things like um, in, in, in a lot of these debates um, and uh, you know, certain words become banned or forbidden um, and um, there's something really strange and interesting is going on there with language that uh, I think probably escapes our notice because language is the tool we use to think about the world. So it becomes hard to, to look at and think about language itself. When it's completely lost the human element of human suffering and what's actually happening to real people on the ground. I, I want to tell a little personal story. Um, many years ago, when my father was dying, um, right towards the end of it, it was pretty obvious he was dying. His organs were shutting down one by one and, and he was at home with me and I was caring for him. It, it's a long story, but anyway, in the middle of the night, one night, he got extremely bad and it was very difficult for me. And I called um, his doctor to ask if he could admit him to the hospital. And the doctor said, Absolutely not. He said, if I admitted him to the hospital at this point when he might have less than 24 hours to live, I'll lose my ability to have Medicare patients for six months because the administrators will put me on a ban. Wow. Because anytime you admit someone to the hospital and they die within 24 hours, that means that, that you cost the hospital this extra day when the person was a goner anyway. Jeez. He came out and said that to me when I'm holding my father in my arms dying, that he couldn't put him in a hospital because of what the administrator said. Now, that, that goes to show you a lot of things. One of the things it shows you is how susceptible I am to authority because I just 
thought, well, that's that. What can I do? But because my dad um, was elderly, they the county had a visiting nurse come in once a week to do, you know, take um, heart and all, you know, take heart and temperature and all that kind of stuff. And the next morning happened to be when the visiting nurse came. And so she took one look at my dad and she said, why isn't he in a hospital? And I told her what the doctor had said. And she said, I don't care what he says. I will get him into a hospital. And so she called around until she found a doctor that was willing to admit him. Wow. So my dad was able to have three days and at least some relative comfort in the hospital before he died instead of dying in agony. Um, but that's, that's what happens when you put it in the hands of administrators and data and underwriters figuring out what it costs the system if you do a certain thing. And these people now that are banning certain drugs because supposedly the data doesn't show the efficacy of the drug, they're not taking into account the people that are dying without these drugs that are being put on ventilators because there's no other hope and the ventilator itself tears up their insides. They're not taking that stuff into account. They're only looking at the data. Yeah. And in some cases, maybe they even think that these are distraction from something that they think will be the real cure that they're, that maybe they're working on. But the problem is they don't see their own uh, conflicts of interest as in those, those kind of exchanges sometimes, um, which are, you know, unfortunately financial as well um not on occasion so it's you know it's yeah i think like I, i'm not an expert in any of these things so it's like it, it's hard to know what's really happening but when you watch you know like an hour-long uh conversation with a doctor who's just impassioned about um what he believes would be a life-saving treatment that um you know even if he's wrong and it seems like that the, the drug is, you know, at least relatively safe, you would think, well, why not? Why wouldn't you want that? You know, even if there's maybe, maybe, it, you know, there's some usual, unusual reason why it only helps, you know, 10% of patients, right? Or it only helps people that you get the drug to really early in the life stage of disease, or like, or something like that, like, you'd, you think you'd still want to broadcast anything effective, you know, um, I was telling you earlier, um, that my dad had gotten COVID recently and, um, you know, he went to an urgent care and they just sent him home basically with zero treatment just said, Hey, yeah, monitor your blood ox levels. And once it gets below 90, you go to the hospital, um, which, you know, and luckily he, he sought out some other treatment and got some, some treatment that actually turned around, but his, his blood oxygen was, was plummeting. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the doctors, he, it was just his family doctor, which is this little country doctor in the middle of nowhere in Georgia, uh, that put him on a regimen of stuff that did include some of these, uh, kind of, um, you know, not, I guess, non-standard, you know, drugs, but I mean, it really turned around really within like 24 hours, uh, it was, it was pretty dramatic. And so it's, um, and, and that doctor, you know, he, he's seeing patients every day and, and, you know, he's, he's making decisions based on, you know, what he sees effective and he's, you know, has gotten really great effects with, with using um, this particular regimen of drugs. And you would think that that would be something that you'd want to broadcast as far as possible in this day where you, I mean, you, the, the stories of, of death and in even, you know, I have, I have a good friend of mine that's about my age. He's suffering really poorly with uh, long haul COVID symptoms that to the point where he's basically been out of work for like uh, the last two months. Um, he, he started going back to work, but he only works like eight hours a week. So he's still on some form of disability. Um, and it's, it's just surprising to me that there's, um, there's a very kind of rigorous orthodoxy about what one can even talk about uh, and publicize relative to what works with these things. Yeah, one of my one of my Facebook friends had also is still going through the long haul COVID thing, eight months now going on. And the weird way that it affected her is that she could no longer tolerate light, hmm. sunlight, daylight during this. She couldn't go outside during the day. The extreme pain from daylight, and 
you know, I, it's just hard to imagine. And, and she's not, not elderly. She's probably in her 40s. So I, I kind of wonder if it doesn't even have more of an effect on younger people when it gets so entrenched like that. Yeah. I'd like to show this other clip of um, Ian McGilchrist because Definitely. I think it fits in here. And I'm going to have to... Uh, Put this on the right time slot, 3145. I will post both of these videos in the. Mind. Science is an adventure. Science is imaginative. That's why I love it. In fact, uh, uh, you know, until I got to university, I was very, very keen to do science. And then I realized actually there's other very important things as well. But, you know, having been there again in science, I can say that really the interesting stuff is to do with, yes, you have to be careful. You have to be, you have to rely a lot on empirical data, but that's exactly what the left hemisphere doesn't do. If it has data that it doesn't like, because it don't fit the paradigm, it just goes, must be wrong. They must have cheated on the experiment. The phenomenon doesn't exist. Can't do, because it says in my book, it's like this. Now, that's left hemisphere, as it were, slant on science, mechanistic, stuck in set, because one of the things about the left hemisphere is it's sticky. Once it gets hold of something, it doesn't want to let go of it. So it's very conventional. But again, most great scientists were actually mavericks in a way. They struck out on something else because they'd seen a discrepancy. There was something there that didn't fit. That's actually how we discovered or how not we discovered, but how, as it were, Copernicus and so on discovered that probably we ro rotate around the sun. So it's the ability not to throw away the details. Obviously, you don't want to keep changing your theory with every detail that comes up because it may just be a, a one-off finding, but it's finding the balance. It's always finding the balance, always, between the analytic and the synthetic. And the um, synthetic is a technical term in philosophy, meaning the putting together. Mm. Not artificial. Yeah. Um, I know you know that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, and so we need the balance between these two, but they're not of equal value. Because the way I see it is the right hemisphere has the first take on things before it's jumped to conclusions. The left hemisphere jumps to conclusions much more than the right hemisphere. So in some ways, it's much less reliable. Its judgments are not so good. They're hastier, they're cruder, and it gets angrier if it's challenged. And the right hemisphere often says, well, maybe I might not be right here. It's very happy with uncertainty and ambiguity, which is actually the way you make progress in art or science. So I thought that was so cool when he said the left hemisphere gets angrier when it's challenged, because, I mean, isn't that what we're seeing? That this, the very sciencey science, the very atomization of, of all these, uh, bits of data if you challenge their conclusions they get so angry right mm. there's no openness to any other possibility yeah and you made a point too like you know if you look at the history of science it is a history of mavericks it's it's, it's people that <clears throat> not only do they have an interesting idea but they also had a sort of um i don't know what you would call it a sort of individuality a sort of uh a sense of ownership or um courage to go against the flow. Um, and, and that's, I mean, anybody that's a scientist can, can tell you all these stories of like, you know, Copernicus and Galileo and et cetera, like in the ways in which they had to go against uh, the thinking of their times to, to, to make, uh, to publish their findings and to, you know, bless humanity. And now it's this weird sort of thinking that, uh, you know, no, what science is, is about peer review. Um, I was listening to some, I, I don't know if it was on, where was it? it was on Clubhouse or one of these audio channel things where, where the Weinstein brothers were chatting about some things and they were talking about like the ways in which you, you can kind of like peer review doesn't make its way into science until like, like the late sixties or like, you know, that's when it became a thing and just how, how science is really diminished in terms of it, a lot of its novel um, you know, things that it's discovered since then. And, and you could think there's a lot of reasons why that would come about, right? Because like, 
you know, if, if you get something peer reviewed, like basically everybody else has to agree with what you're saying for it to get published. And, and part of, and part of what that means as well is that, um, you know, those other people may have uh, work that they're doing, you know, they may have grants they've already written to do particular types of work where, you know, if this thing um, was published and showed that really science should be moving in another direction, it would, it would kind of cut them off at the knees, right, with, with the work they're trying to do. So it's like, there's all sorts of vested interest in that procedure. So there's, it kind of keeps people kind of in a lock you know, a straitjacket of orthodoxy of, of where, what their ideas are. So um, it, well, it, it's, it, it's a perfect uh, set of hoops that you have to jump through in order to be part of the club. I mean, it reminds me of the licensing requirements for, I remember a few years ago, there was this woman who did braiding. She was an expert at doing braiding and she was doing braiding for, for people in her cultural community that wanted their hair braided and um, the, the licensing people came up against her and said, if you want to do braiding and get money for it, you have to go and go to beauty school and it's an 18 month thing. And then the license is going to cost you so much. That's not even the state that's setting those requirements. It's all the other cosmeticians who have got yeah. together and said, we're going to set licensing requirements that keeps our club smaller so that we can charge more money. And then these people that might have a talent that they could share, like braiding, are unable yeah. to do that because they don't fit the licensing requirements. And it's that way in every one of these fields. I mean, even the, the bar association did, did that where they, they gather the horses and they circle the wagons and everybody else stay out, you know? So um, peer review is kind of like that. I didn't realize it was so recent. That's yeah. kind of stunning, but maybe that's why nothing has happened since 1960. Yeah, they were they were making the the. Would you rather have the science from before that 1970 or or the science that's been achieved afterwards? And they're like, yeah, well, it looks most of the, like things like you know, especially the breakthroughs in in you know hardcore physics, where you know most of those happened prior to. So, um. Yeah, I do, I do think there's something about like uh, institutionalizing these these things that kind of breaks down the very mechanism by where whereby it works and why it was so effective and why we had such a high esteem for it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, and it keeps out anybody that might be on the margins. You know, Jonathan Peugeot is saying all the interesting stuff always happens on the margins. But if you make it impossible for the margins to participate in the hierarchy, then they're eventually going to show up as monsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, yeah. He's got such an amazing way of seeing the patterns. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what it would be like to be him going around and seeing the world through those eyes. It's uh, it's strange. Um, he, he knew he talks about how um. It's not a good thing that he has to explain these things to us, though. <laughs> Because he's like this, you know. This is just how people saw things. They they wouldn't have been able to articulate them in the way that he does, but they would have been able to make decisions based on them. They would have had feelings and and, and kind of intuitions that guided them along these lines. Um, and we've just kind of um, it's uh, it's it's been lost. Well, I really want to get back at some point to the whole conversation about. Um, Owen Barfield and the the what it means to enter back into participation again. I mean, although it would be a different kind of participation than the original participation, because um, it fits in with and I can't even remember what it is, but something that I was working on last week. Oh, I, I think it was um, Paula Boddington's talk about re-enchantment and maybe Paul was saying, was it Paul who was saying he doesn't like that term re-enchantment? Somebody's saying they don't like the term re-enchantment, but you know, I'd like to have the discussion about what is the difference between re-enchantment and final participation. And maybe we could cue that up for some time in the future. Yeah, that'd be really good. Um, I just got two new of his books um, that I hadn't read recently. One of them is a really tiny book that we might could use as um, 
for, for our discussion. It's called um, Speaker's Meaning. It's, it's really just, it's basically just a lecture he gave that got converted into a book or maybe it's like a series of like two or three lectures that, um, and it's, it, it, for me, it was one of the easiest uh, in terms of because probably because he's 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 speaking and not writing so he probably had to dumb it down a little bit more uh, make it more plain to his audience um that was um much more easy to understand his ideas about language and how fundamental they were to to his you know evolution of consciousness idea mm-hmm. so maybe maybe i'll uh find some some good quotes from that to send your way yeah or yeah, you could just send me a link to where I can find the book too. So that sounds really good. It's so good to talk to you again, Michael. Um, do you feel like you're learning a lot with your new role in life? Definitely. It's uh, yeah, it's it's crazy how how different life is. You know, becoming you know a husband and a father. So um, yeah, I'm I'm learning new things every day. <laughs> Most mostly be a failure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely. My husband and I used to always joke that when we got married, we learned what selfishness was, and then when we had a child, we we deeply learned <laughs> how <laughs> selfish we were. <laughs> yeah, lots of learning. Well, this has been great, Michael. I look forward to uh, having another conversation with you in the future, and. Uh, we managed to get through this whole episode without ever pronouncing the word that starts with I. So maybe we won't get canceled because I don't know if you realize that Zoom now has a new thing. Uh, not not Zoom. Uh, YouTube has a new thing that when you when you upload the video, there's not three j- hoops to jump through, but a final hoop. And the final hoop is that they check to see whether there's anything that would get you Oh, really? So they they do like an audio transcription of every word and go up. Here's one of the words we don't like. Well, I don't know how they do the checking, but it takes quite a bit longer now to upload to YouTube because it goes through this final check. And then sometimes it'll say the checking is taking longer than usual. And then you wonder, oh, did they pick up on some nuance that maybe we got a little bit too close to something controversial? (laughs) But then in the end, it'll finally say, okay, you passed all the checks and they'll let you through. But that's wow. new just in the last month or so. Very interesting. So the, the handcuffs are getting tighter all the time. But you know, but we still have the opportunity to speak freely now. So let's speak, let's do it. Okay. Definitely. Give my best to the family. Yeah, we'll do. Good seeing you, Karen. Bye.